shares of Moderna are up a little bit over 23% right now on news of some positive results from their phase one vaccine trials, vaccine to fight the coronavirus, COVID-19. And joining us to discuss this is the CEO of Moderna, Stefan Bansell. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Thank you for having me. Also want to let you know that Anjali Kemlani is joining us. She covers coronavirus for us, and we're going to break down so much of what's going on here. But let me just jump in with a very simple question. You tested, or you, this phase one was 45 people. As I read, eight of them produced the necessary kind of antibody to inactivate the virus. If this is all good and it gets us to an actual vaccine, how quickly can we start inoculating people? So... That will also depend on the FDA. So the current plan is the following. We said this morning, we are working hard with the agency to be able to start a phase three. Thousands of people tested in a phase three study as early as July. It will take a, a bit of time to enroll thousands of people. And then you have to basically run a placebo control study to see with natural infection in the fall. So the earliest time could be us ready to send all the data to the FDA toward the end of the year, and then it will really depend on how long it will take them to then approve it. Stefan Anjali here. Looking at the results that you had, one of the concerns I know we heard earlier on the call was that uh, when you get to the phase three point, what will the population of patients be? In addition to that, you're working with a new technology. So now with these results, have any of those obstacles come to rest and what do you see as the challenges ahead? Yes, so the good news is that this is not our first vaccine. This is actually our 10th vaccine in clinical studies around the world. We've done a lot of vaccines, so we start to understand the technology a little bit. Of course, there is no product approved yet with messenger RNA. Uh, but we think that uh, the understanding of the science is pretty robust now. We've had a great dialogue uh, with the agency. Uh, as you know, this is partnered with NIAD. So Dr. Tony Sfarci's team actually ran the phase one. Uh, and so uh, we're going to continue to work and make sure we have a very big safety database. I think that's going to be the key. We have not disclosed yet the size of a phase three because we're still discussing with the FDA. But as soon as the size of a phase three and the final dose for a phase three will be agreed upon, we will, of course, communicate those things. But I would expect many thousands of people across different age range, comorbidity, we're having all those discussions as we speak because, as you know, the epidemiology of, uh, of uh, the virus and the type of disease it creates, it's important that we understand who we can protect uh, with this vaccine potentially. Stefan, it's Julie here. And on that note, there is, have been questions about whether possessing the antibodies or having had COVID-19 actually means that you have immunity going forward. So how do we then, once you test that the vaccine does indeed give one the antibodies, how does one test then that antibodies actually prevent you from getting COVID-19? Yes, that's a, a virus, as you know, that's still very new and we are all still learning about this virus and the disease associated with virus like in children uh, almost on a daily basis. So the way we think about it is just the old traditional way, you have to run a very large phase three placebo control study. And the question we're gonna be asking ourselves and the agency as well, is what is the efficacy rate? How many people that get vaccine in the same region, in the same town, in the same cities, get protected thanks to the vaccination versus the people that were on placebo? And we're gonna be able to know the answer very clearly. This is gonna be a very large study. So we're gonna know is the vaccine a 50% efficacy, 90% efficacy, 10% efficacy? We don't know yet. The great news of this morning is the following. We know humans, can make neutralizing antibodies to the virus. This was shown in the labs of the NIH. That's the data we presented this morning. And we've shown that the quantity, the tighter of the antibody was at or above the level of people that got disease. So that's a good indication. The other piece that I think is important to look at it together is we announced this morning that we're able in a mice challenge study to show we could protect from the virus replicating in the lung of a mice. So the way you do it is you basically vaccinate the animals and then you run a placebo study, placebo control, where you give a very high dose of a virus and you try to see, can you protect the virus from multiplicating in the lungs? And we did show this was possible. All the animals had full protection. 
in terms of copies or lack of copies of a virus in their land. Right. And on that note, I know that you spoke earlier of, uh, and addressed this earlier, uh, but pricing is one of the things that I think many are concerned about, especially when you're talking about accessibility of the virus because of this unprecedented global demand that you're faced with. Um, I know that the discussions haven't happened yet, but you, your company specifically has had a lot of input from the federal government and support there. Is that going to be a, a major factor in how you price? So I think like any products, we're going to want to start by doing the analysis on what's the value of this vaccine. Because you don't pick numbers out of thin air. I mean, some might. That's not how we intend to do it. So we're going to work with uh, professional companies who do that for a living, work with academic groups that have models to look at the value of, of a medicine like this vaccine to understand, okay, what do we think it's roughly worth? Then we're going to, of course, look at... Uh, not wanting to maximize profit. This is not the product when we're going to want to maximize profit. We have a very big portfolio. We understand it's a pandemic. So this is not the price where we say this is the price where it's the full value of a product. And because there's nothing else on the market, we're going to charge all of that value. That is not our intent. We want to use the first principle of value and of uh, not maximizing profits. Uh, the piece that's going to be Interesting, I think, to think about, like the other product that are used in the healthcare system, you know, is people pay for masks, you know, people pay for ventilators, people pay for medicines, uh, people pay, of course, for the nurses and the docs that are the front line, you know, risking their life for, 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 for helping others. So we need to understand what is the value of this vaccine so that we can start to have a dialogue around it. And Stefan... How quickly can you ramp up production, assuming this is the vaccine? Can you transfer this technology to other companies? For instance, Johnson & Johnson is already producing its vaccine at risk. They say it'll take at least to the end of next year to have a billion uh, doses, and they're not even testing just yet. So how quickly could you ramp up production? Yeah, so that's a great question. So as you can appreciate, when we started 2020, we did not plan to be ready for a pandemic. Uh, the plant we have in Massachusetts is able at full capacity to produce around 100 million doses, assuming the 50 microgram or middle dose into that phase one study. Of course, for most commercial vaccine, 100 million doses is a large number, but for a pandemic on the planet, it's a very tiny number. And so a couple of months ago, the team and I start to brainstorm about, okay, how do we get to a billion doses per year? And we said that as a, as a kind of, of a scale we were looking for, kind of a 10x from where we could go internally. And so we announced two weeks ago a strategic partnership with Lanza. Lanza is one of the oldest and biggest contract manufacturer in the pharmaceutical industries. They are based in Switzerland. They have plants around the world. And we've announced this partnership with the ability to go up to a billion doses per year. We've announced also that we're already doing technology transfer to Lonza, that it will be completed in June. And as of July this year, Lonza factory in New Hampshire is going to start making at risk, because the product won't be approved, obviously, at risk as many doses as they can. In our Massachusetts plant that is run by the Moderna team, we are doing the same, making as much product as we can. And we're going to enable several plants of Lonza to get over time, it won't happen you know, in two weeks, but to get over time to an annual run rate of a billion dollars per year. Stefan, the industry has been under such immense pressure, not just from the outbreak, but even pre-outbreak discussing uh, development methods and pricing pressures. Do you feel like right now there's even more pressure to have maybe a more cautious outlook um, than before for products or has nothing changed? To say that nothing has changed when we're in the middle of one in a hundred year pandemic will be uh, a bit strange. Um, but uh, I think I, I go back to value, which is think about how much the current pandemic is costing hospitals and the states. Uh, I've had the chance of being in Boston. We have you know, amazing hospital in Boston. And I know several of uh, different leaders of those hospitals. And they tell me the cost today just of taking care of COVID is just incredible. Uh, and so we need to think about all those pieces because today those are real dollars going out of you know, uh, government's pocket or insurer's pocket or you know, consumer's pocket if they don't have insurance, unfortunately. 
And so we need to figure out a way to reduce that drain of, of dollars into the healthcare system just to make sure people don't die. Stefan Bansel, CEO of Moderna, we wish you the best and hope that this is the, uh, the vaccine that we're all looking for. Good luck to your team. We'll be right back. Thank you. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.